Awesome. We've got audio up? Great. Thank you. So one of the great things about being a computer engineer is that you are significantly less bound uh, by the laws of, of physics. Um, people often say to me, oh, we're, we're talking about building IT systems, you know, you wouldn't build my house like, like this, and, you know, certainly I wouldn't build a house like that. Um, equally, if I've got a house, uh, it's very unusual for my wife to let me um, paint a couple of the rooms just to see if we like the colour uh, with the intention of changing them back. IT is very amenable to experimentation, to trying things, to measuring them, and to seeing if the hypothesis that we took in uh, is actually the case. Who thinks they do a pretty good job of actually experimenting on top of their IT systems at the moment? Who's done some experiments? Yeah? Were they really experiments? Or were they, you did something and then it was a complete bloody disaster, right? And so you learnt from it. Because the thing with those sorts of experiments are usually very, very expensive. And the experiments you want to start to try and run are very, very cheap. Because we can't get to systems of intelligence, that systems where actually we let the mach machine be a bit intelligent, right? unless we first get to systems of experimentation, unless it's actually reasonably economical, reasonably low risk for us to try things, but also for us to try things and know if what we were trying was a success or not. Okay? So experimentation is not just learning from mistakes. It's actually going in and having a systematic, methodological approach to trying something, to measuring the outcomes, and then to determining what we do next. To make our systems amenable to experimentation, they need to be malleable, they need to be observable, and they need to be engaged. And what do I mean by that? They've got to be malleable. They have to be cost-effective to change. We don't experiment by putting in a new ERP system. Anybody done that? Done a, like a, an AX rollout experiment? Oh, well, you should, let's try that one. All right? Um, you know, so there are some systems that are really not amenable to experimentation. Um, we often call those systems of record. It's got to be reasonably economical to do that. It has to be observable. You know, we have to instrument the systems and the business process sufficiently that we know what the hell's going on. Right? Not just by anecdote, oh, that worked out and it was kind of good and we think it probably worked, right? uh, but actually truly measurable instrumentation right, that tells us how that system and that business process is running. Again, we're probably not so good at this um, as computer engineers. We're pretty good at instrumenting systems to work out when they've broken, for fault diagnostics, but actually we're quite bad at instrumenting them to work out when they're working really well. So it needs to be sufficiently observable, and the system needs to be engaged. Right? You can't do this experimentation when you're in UAT. Right? Who's done an agile project? Right? Ah, oh, see, so I, agile is interesting, right? Because sort of the story is we're going to do this agile project. You can change your mind halfway through. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. <laughs> um, and sometimes, and, and uh, we're not going to tell you what you're going to get, um, and we're not going to tell you how much it's going to cost, but you can change your mind all the way through. Um, that's shit bloody useless, right? If the only mind change you want to do is between when we start the project and when you go live. Right? Agile is only useful if you want to change your mind after you go live. Otherwise, we should work out what the hell we're going to do, we should do it, we should go live, and we'll bugger off. But what Agile does get you is this process of being able to confidently ship small incremental changes to your systems very, very easily. Because the problem with, with most system change are the transaction costs. Right? I'm going to make a change to my system, but actually it's going to take me four days to go through and do that. So I'm not going to make a little change to my system. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bucket up a whole lot of changes. All right? So let's do a couple of months' work, and then release it, because that way we amortize the cost of those four days that we've got to spend releasing it. Which is great, but if we've got two months' worth of work versus two hours' worth of work shipping into production, what do we think our risk profile looks like? 
bit sketchy, right? So what do we do? Spend more time testing it, right? So what does that do? Takes our four-day release cycle and makes it even greater, right? So Agile is all about delivering you something useful after go live. So you need that system to be engaged and actually being used. You need it to be being used quite a lot. If you want to experiment quite a lot, you need quite a lot of raw experimentation material. All right? The raw material of experimentation in an IT system is usage. It might be your users using it. It might be data you're pushing through it. All right? It's got to be doing stuff. And the more stuff it's doing, all right, the more you can experiment. The problem with experiments is everything becomes a hyperparameter. Right? If you change a whole lot of different things at once, it's very hard to unwind them and pick out which one actually made the difference. You need lots of that raw material so that you can change things independently and then change things paired up and then change things at higher dimensions to work out what actually does make the difference. So let's talk a bit about malleability. This is from our friends at which large web firm? Facebook. All right? If you don't know whether something's going to be a good idea, just go and bloody do it. Right? and try it, um, and if it's good, you're good, and if it's not, you're not, but go into things knowing what you are expecting. Right? Go into things understanding that this is seeing if it works, and you are prepared to completely write off the investment if it doesn't. Realistically, for most New Zealand organisations, I think you know, a week of implementation time for experimental stuff is probably too much. Again, you know, you get very hampered by scale in this area, right, because experimentation can be expensive. We have experimented for the last three years in that Microsoft Demand Centre project. We have spent many, many millions of dollars. Right? Um, but we are dealing with incremental improvements over a very, very large customer base. So what do you do if it's too hard to experiment? Right? You buy one of these. Who's got one of these? Who's got a yellow one? I would really like one of those. The problem is I don't like coffee. Um, this is a Keurig coffee machine. You feed it cartridges. There are over 500 different types of K cups that you can put into this thing. All right? There's hipster coffee, big brand coffee. There is sweet and creamy nutty hazelnut coffee. Right. And in fact, there's even Krispy Kreme donuts decaf. This thing is highly amenable to experimentation. It only does coffee. It's not a bloody soda stream. If you want fizzy water, ain't going to work for you. Right. But to the extent that you're experimenting with coffee, it's fantastic for that purpose. Because for a really low cost, you can get the Krispy Kreme decaf coffee, right? and you can see if you know, your um, preconceived notions as to the quality of coffee, don't drink coffee, right? from Krispy Kreme donuts actually prove to be true. Right? It's a cartridge-based system. It's a system that's designed to try different things. Right? You can try two of these together. You can have hipster coffee and Krispy Kreme coffee. Right? Again only going to make coffee, but it's designed to do these things. We have the equivalent of cartridge-loaded software systems. These are cartridge-loaded software systems, something like Click Dimensions, right, that's been delivered as part of the, the CSP solution that we, we're offering as of today. It's a cartridge-loaded experimentation platform for marketing. We can easily feed it different cartridges, Right? Different plans of attack, we can run them cost effectively, we can measure the results, we can rinse and repeat. There's a whole lot of opportunity to make better use of these cartridge delivered software systems. Right? Even before we get into talking about you know, whether we should be agile and so on and so forth. You know? As you scale, you know, you will want to see some of your systems, particularly the systems that face your customers, right, be more agile, be more amenable to change over time. But actually, there's a whole lot of low-hanging fruit that you can pick up 
by taking these off-the-shelf systems that are designed to be end-user, and that's the folks in this room, customizable, and that provide analytics and instrumentation to help you unpick exactly what those customizations have done. Which brings us, talking a little bit more about the Azure Demand Center. So we spoke a bit about this this morning. It is a very, very large system. Right? Uh, it does a very, very large amount of throughput. It's, probably, it's got tens of millions of customer records, right? dealing with you know, hundreds, 100 odd thousand um, you know, new leads every week. What does it look like? It's got cartridge-based components. We have to deal with a whole bunch of systems of record. It's integrated with a whole lot of Microsoft internal applications, and they are of varying vintages, um, and therefore varying levels of convenience and pleasure to work with. Um, we want to isolate our end users, our marketers, from those systems. Equally, we want to isolate those systems from our end users and marketers. We don't want to break stuff. At the top layer, we have the different ways that we go out and engage with customers. We have events, we have web pages, we have email, we have an outbound uh, and inbound telephony call center. There are a whole lot of people who spend all day in that call center calling customers. Right? They are part of the system. We are going to deploy them for the purposes of our experiments. We effectively need an API to deploy them. And we have that, right? We give them call down scripts. Um, but actually, don't underestimate the potential of using people as an experimentational API in your solutions. Anyone ever heard of a thing called Fancy Hands? It's like um, sort of task at a time personal assistance. So I can literally just jump on my telephone and call up Fancy Hands and say, please call the hotel over here and book me a room and blah, 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 blah. They expose APIs to you. You can actually get API-based integration to people. Right? Um, Amazon's Mechanical Turk, similar sort of thing. Right? API-based integration to people. So when you're doing these experiments, think about, you know, actually I could go and build a bunch of technology to solve this at a whole lot of investment, or at least for the first little while while I try and find my feet, during the experimental phase, I'll shell out to a real person, either within my four walls or outside, and they can run the piece of process with a bit of human intelligence and shell back in, and if we find that works, then we'll lift the level of automation. So we've effectively got this API at the top layer as well that we need to work with, and again, we don't want to break it. And then in the middle, we've got our cartridge-delivered software applications. In this case, a marketing automation platform called Marketo. It's a really large scale, enterprise focused marketing automation platform. And we can expose that to the marketers and the marketers can run their experiments and then the marketers can see the results of those experiments through the data warehouse and through that Marketo tool and they can fine tune those experiments. And again, very hard to do, particularly hard to do for non-technical people, if you want to have a rapid turnaround of experimentation, you need to give them a tool that's you know, pretty easy to plug stuff into and out of. These things have got to be observable. So again, we're pretty good at um, instrumenting applications for, for break-fix scenarios. We're kind of not that good at actually instrumenting them in terms of understanding how users are using them. Cookies, right? Lots of paranoia about cookies. Not unjustifiable, because there are plenty of people who make excellent use of cookies across the web to track your every move. Anybody read the book, um, What Stays in Vegas? Highly recommend it. You find it on Amazon as an audio book as well. Uh, you should see it as sort of half big loud warning about the risks of this stuff and half, wow, that's really fantastic. I hope I can aspire to doing that level of, um, of uh, instrumentation across my customers. Talks a bunch about how the casinos do it, talks a bunch about how the big data gathering companies in the US do it. It's called What Stays in Vegas or something like that. 
If you run multiple systems that people interact with, make sure that you are taking full advantage of things like cookies to um, uniquely identify them across all of those systems. Online stuff, online stuff is super easy, right? If you're not doing a good job on online stuff, it, it's actually really, really quick and easy to get there. Um, you know, but you really should be. So once you start getting offline, that things get a bit more exciting. Who can tell me what these are? Anybody? Yell it out. Beacons. They're beacons, right? So they're basically little Bluetooth things, and they send out a Bluetooth signal with a unique identifier, and if you've got an app on your mobile phone, it can pick up that, that unique identifier, and the app will communicate back up to the cloud and notify some system that it can see that identifier. These are cookies for the physical world. If you would love to know when customers come to your stores, these are the sorts of things you can use. There are actually other approaches as well. A great one is free Wi-Fi. Who's in retail? Put your hands right up. Right? Leave them up if you've got free Wi-Fi in your store. Yeah? Why do we want free Wi-Fi in our store? Because customers want to use it, right? Why do we want customers to use it? Because once they've connected to our Wi-Fi, we can watch that MAC address of that wireless device endpoint, and we know every time they come back to our store with a unique identifier. Now, we can do cool things like correlate it to transactional data um, and all sorts of stuff to really gain a great level of insight. The amazing instrumentation you get in the online world with e-commerce is coming to the physical world. Who can tell me what these are? These are super cool. They're 30 bucks, so everybody wants one. It's a Texas Instrument Sensor Tag. So it's a little microcontroller, 32-bit microcontroller. It's got Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or 6 low pan, which is kind of a, a sort of a IP stack variant. Um, it's got uh, humidity, air pressure, two types of temperature, 6 axis accelerometer. What else has it got? Uh, magnetometer for 30 bucks. Right. We've been using a bunch of these doing IoT prototypes. We're now using a bunch of these actually starting to do real world IoT systems. It's actually really quite cheap to start instrumenting things. Who's got a vehicle fleet? Right. We can buy the little things that plug into those vehicles right, to pull instrumentation off them for you know, 20, 30 bucks. It's actually really easy to start doing some of this smart asset management stuff. So observability, right, and, the, and our need to come back and work out if our experiments succeeded or failed, you know, we need to have that data there. Storage is really cheap, and I said this again last year, right, storage is dirt cheap, right? Data is very, very expensive. Because data requires typically that we do something real to generate it. Right? And if you don't capture it when you first generate it, and you've got to go and get it some other way, right, it can be quite expensive. It can be completely infeasible to go and get it. You, know, you should err on the side of keeping more data than you need. So we're doing some interesting stuff with uh, some smart appliances at the moment. Now, I can't tell you what they are, but think printers and ink but maybe the ink cartridge is a little smaller. Um, so we've got a client with a, a dumb product, and we put a chip in it, um, which is basically one of those, um, those IoT sensor tags. Right? That lets us pull data off that system. So we're pulling a mixture of sort of vibration data and using the magnetometer to, to, to watch for particular cycles um, in the system. And then we push that up into a thing called Azure IoT Suite. Azure IoT Suite here is effectively our cartridge end user customizable platform. Right? We can write rules inside that that let us try different things with these devices, receiving data in and pushing data back out. The other system we use that's end user um, customizable is, is Power BI. Um, but the important thing here is that we also capture all of the raw data off all of the parts of this platform. Um, and in fact, using the same personalization platform for a different use case, we're dealing with you know, about a terabyte of data um, 
per day, uh, which is quite a lot of data. Um, and again, the nice thing is it's cheap to store, and the tools are now available in the cloud where you can actually store the data, and if you need to go back and get access to it, you can stand up a bunch of capacity, go and query across that historical data set, and then turn that capacity back down. So quite different to what you'd think of as you know, your classical data warehouse scenario. In a big on-prem data warehouse, you basically size the data warehouse based on how much data you're going to have and what your peak usage is. All right. So that naturally means that you want to dial both of those back. All right. I want to store less data because I don't want to be paying too much for it. And I don't want to have a really big usage peak because I have to buy a big data warehouse. The beauty of the cloud is that we consume the data, gigabyte by gigabyte by gigabyte, a few cents a gigabyte, and we consume the processing power, effectively that, that data warehouse capacity, just by changing the dial. Um, so you know, stuff that's come out recently that does that, a thing called uh, Azure SQL Data Warehouse, which if you're familiar with Microsoft's um, MPP data warehouse product, um, it's that, but in a turn the dial mode. Now, so literally, you can have data sitting there at rest, costing you nothing, and then you can dial up a massive MPP data warehouse that's costing you, you know, three or $4,000 an hour, run your queries, and then turn it back off again. Now, obviously, you probably don't want to run three or $4,000 an hour, but having that capacity on tap is pretty neat. Did a piece of work last month, again, processing seven, 800 terabytes of data over about 60 minutes um, with a 3,500 node computing cluster in the cloud. This stuff's really interesting when you're down here in New Zealand and Australia, and actually you, ne you never want to, you never have enough usage to justify these big systems if you had to buy the whole thing. But actually, you can often find use cases where you wouldn't mind doing it for a short period of time. And engaged. So we're working with a, uh, a partner in the US at the moment. And they've got some tools that bolt into, into mobile apps. Um, and one of the things they said, you know, our tool works best when you've got at least a million app installs to work with. Um, so again, this comes back to the idea that experimentation is hard without those raw materials. Um, and so it's a particularly precious resource that you need to think about as you go around and do this. You know, your experiments are effectively going to be consuming customer engagement, consuming user engagement, consuming those opportunities to try something and learn from it. Um, you know, and this is probably the scarcest resource that you're going to have at the smaller scale is the level of customer engagement you've got across these systems and therefore the level of experimentation and different experiments that you can run. So I fundamentally think that before you can even start talking about systems of intelligence, you've kind of got to have got systems of experimentation and you have to have mechanisms in place to be able to experiment, right? Because systems of intelligence, we're talking about trusting the machine and still a little cagey on trusting the machine, right? Um, and if the machine says, go and install AX7, we're probably not gonna do that, right? But if the machine says, you know, try this marketing campaign with a thousand customers, it's a whole lot more, more palatable. So systems of intelligence is, is a little bit like flipping the model. So if we think about how we build IT systems at the moment, we've got inputs, outputs, we've got an IT system, right? Basically, we tip expertise into it. You call up a fantastic IT services vendor, and they come dressed in brightly colored shirts, and you tip some of their expertise in it, right? But probably more significantly is you tip a whole bunch of your organization's time and people into these IT systems. Right? And you need that expertise to interpret the outputs. Right? You need that expertise to, be able to work out how that might feed back into experimentation. Machine learning is a bit, is a bit about flipping that model. Right? So it's actually we feed sufficient meta expertise into the system so it understands some basic parameters and then we have it learn from what occurs. 
And that learning is, is in many situations, not all, but in many, available to us as a new output of the system. Actually, we can take the models out, we can take those learnings out. Um, if people have ever done customer segmentation and pr propensity modeling, I know that, again, Mike's done a little bit, um, often you'll end up with what's called a decision tree based model that then comes back to you and you can say, okay, it, it actually learnt that set of decision points from my data. Right, so this becomes really valuable because then your system of um, intelligence is all about starting to take advantage of those models to help you get better explanations around outputs right, and to start to feed into those experimental inputs. Anybody doing stuff in machine learning already? Nobody. There is a huge opportunity, right? Again, if I, if I look at the gap, if I look at the gap between, you know, what I see in the US, right? The, the biggest gap is around how people use data. Um, we've all got the same sort of systems. Um, we just we just don't use data all that much yet. Ultimately, what we're aiming to do here is to deliver a higher level of automation, to make decisions faster, to make more accurate decisions, to free up people's time. So to give you an example, we work with another company, um, and again, uh, they do building systems. Think of them as doing stuff a little bit like um, HVAC. Uh, and they put some IoT solutions in and those IoT solutions were initially targeted at um, doing predictive maintenance, so um, making it easier to catch failures before they happened. Um, and actually, as we went through this process, what came out of it is that their maintenance schedules were far more aggressive than they actually needed to be. Um, and they were able to significantly dial back the amount of maintenance they did leave stuff sitting out there for significantly longer and shave a huge amount of cost, but also a huge amount of downtime, of planned downtime, off these systems. And they had no idea that that's, that was going to be the out, outcome. Right? Their, their reason for going in is they thought they were failing too much, they were having too many unexpected failures and they wanted to improve the levels of customer service. What they actually came out of it doing was improving their profit margins. So there's huge opportunity around machine learning. Um, it's a very interesting area because much of the tooling is free. Who can tell me what that logo is for, given that we're here in Auckland? Why is it significant that we're here in Auckland? It was built at Auckland University, right? There's another tool called Weka, which is a really impressive machine learning toolkit, one of the, you know, the, the more significant ones in the world, built at Waikato University. There's a huge amount of expertise in machine learning and data science in the top half of the North Island of New Zealand, and in a room of 300 business people focused on IT systems, nobody's using machine learning at the moment. Um, so something's a little bit weird and broken. This stuff is free, right? Like free as in free beer. Well, because there's, there's, there's different sorts of free in, in computing. This is, this is the website for R. You can tell that it is an academic project because the website uses HTML tables. Um, the cool thing about this is if we have a look at this packages link, uh, slowly but steadily, all right? So R comes with a whole lot of different packages. So if you need to do if you need an implementation of an artificial bee colony optimization, you can get a free package for that. Right? But there are a whole lot of fantastic free packages for building out these data science applications. Um, there's sort of a couple of different approaches. One is R that's very popular, one is Python that's very popular, um, both open source both really well supported by free community um, bits and pieces. It is stepping out of academia. Uh, so the next release of Microsoft SQL Server, SQL Server 2016, includes a thing called Revolution Analytics, which is a specialist build of the R runtime 
that's able to run inside SQL Server. Right, what this means is all, all the power of these statistical models can now be run directly inside SQL Server on data that sits in SQL Server, um, which is going to be quite uh, revolutionary. Um, so the wraps come off that hopefully next week. Uh, I know that Anna, if she's not here, she's out in the back, they've been building some, some stuff for the launch of that next week. Um, but basically what that's going to let you do is take these sort of powerful statistical modeling and learning tools and apply them against your existing data sets and your existing enterprise data tools. And you're sitting there going, yeah, but I have absolutely no idea why I'd want a bee colony uh, modeling and optimization thing. So that was always the problem, right? Mach machine learning, the, 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 the tools have become so much more available, all right? But actually, the biggest gap is still, what the hell am I going to do with this stuff? Um, so they are becoming easier to use. So Microsoft have this thing called Azure Machine Learning. Um, and Azure Machine Learning is basically um, a runtime in the cloud for running these machine learning algorithms. And what they've then done is they've built out a bunch of um, off-the-shelf APIs that basically take all that crazy stuff you saw on the R website and bring it to bear on some quite specific, quite focused business type tasks. Facial identification, text analysis and so forth. Who's used the um, social media monitoring dynamic CRM? Where it looks at your social feeds and gives you sentiment. Yeah, a few people. So this is that stuff available to you as an API. So I could go, all right, I could do something like that. And yeah, dynamic stay is really great. All right, and it's going to pull out the key phrases so we could do other stuff with that. But the car park was full. Who found that this morning? I had to go across the street. Park. Right, so it'll do textual analysis. Ooh, yeah. So it's, it puts a big premium on there being good car parking. Right? But it, it's doing linguistic analysis across a range of different languages to actually pull out, you know, the key things here. Dynamic stay, great. And in fact, if you, if you drill into the outputs a bit more, it'll, you, it'll break down the fact that the first part of this thing is positive and the second part is negative. All right? And it'll be overweighting the end of the message Right, because that's where we tend to leave those most important points. Exposed to you as an API to use within your applications. Um, and it's entering the public consciousness, right? This stuff is, is no longer just magic. People kind of grok that this is going on. And that's a good thing because it's going to become acceptable. Um, because it probably didn't used to be acceptable that when you walked into a retail store and we had a web camera sitting at the front doing facial recognition, we could know that it was you um, based off the fact that you're friends with us on Facebook. Um, but it's starting to become okay. Um, and in fact, you know, our, our ability to do cool shit with IT in this space massively outstrips the, uh, the cultural boundaries uh, that, that we should be keeping within. <laughs> Um, and so it is a bit of a fraught area, um, but I think, you know, for, for, for sort of the younger generations, actually, they, they kind of grok it, and they kind of don't care, and I think the, the biggest thing that would upset me more than, I know that you're doing it, just do a good job of it, right? In New Zealand, send me these emails, inviting me to go and play golf, and I'm like, you guys are kidding me? Seriously? I go through Rotorua Airport, half a dozen times a year carrying a bloody great ski box and you're, you're telling me to go and play golf. You know, just make sure you do a great job of helping people out. As long as you're doing it for the customer, not doing it to the customer, 
right? You're actually going to be going to be doing pretty well. So this is um, called How Old .NET. So this basically uses the facial APIs of that Azure machine learning I just showed you. We've actually been using those facial APIs and some smart digital signage where we do advertising presentation to people based on high-level demographic profiling from a web camera. Um, so let's actually have a look at it. Um, and James was going on today about um, how, how old or how young you were, James? How old? So how old is James Page? <laughs> Don't laugh, because I'm going to get some more volunteers here soon. All right, so if we use that, how old do we think he looks? It's, it's a baby, oh, it's a baby face, isn't it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> right, so the reason you need a system of experimentation is that, I mean, this stuff, is not 100% accurate, right? <laughs> um, but again, it's fully automated. It doesn't require human intervention, right? We can run this across hundreds of thousands of images very, very quickly. Um, but you know, you do need to, to keep in mind the fact that it, uh, it's not always completely accurate. As I said before, you know, one of the biggest challenges is actually, you know, the tools are very accessible, the tools are very usable, but they are still sophisticated statistical analyses tools, right? Um, you know, you still got to know what a chi-square test is, right? um, and that's probably down to 25% of the room, and then we can keep on drilling uh, before you're really doing anything useful with these tools. But fortunately, there's crowdsourcing. Who's ever heard of Kaggle? K-A-G-G-L-E. You have a gaggle of geese, right? You have a kaggle, no, you have a kaggle of kiwis, no. Kaggle is, um, kaggle is a machine learning crowdsourcing site. So let's have a look at this. So basically, what you can do is you can take some of your data and call up the folks at Kaggle and say, we'd like to run a competition and we'll put X number of dollars up as a prize for the best machine learning model that comes out of running this competition. And then you go run the competition for a couple of months and we'll see what comes back. Um, so there was one that closed just a couple of days ago that had a $100,000 prize. The biggest prize they've ever offered was half a million bucks and you're thinking, holy cow, this is not me. Uh, but this is a company called Rossmann from Germany and they've offered up $35,000 for someone to build a predictive model that can predict sales across their 1,100 or so stores in Germany. And they just dish up some data and off goes the competition. There are about 1,100 teams in this competition so far. And that gives you an interesting way to access some quite smart data science minds on a crowdsource type of model. And I, there are people in the room nodding because I know what they're thinking. <laughs> um, you know, so a really interesting way of being able to approach this. Now, you'll, you'll still need some help to wrangle the data and, and to help set the parameters of the problem. Um, but, you know, an interesting way of, of taking a segue into experimenting with some of this for a, a reasonable price. So, we're in boots and all. What are some of the use cases that we're seeing? This was an interesting piece of research um, uh, done by a crowd called Bark out of Germany just this year, uh, surveying about, uh, they did a survey about, about 500 organizations. This has a, a count of 260 responses. These are the words from the free text answers about their uses of big data tools and machine learning tools. Um, you'll see it's highly customer dominate, dominated. So a lot of these solutions are being um, deployed in customer analytics, churn modeling, um, and those sorts of things. So some of the ones that we've been seeing a lot of. Um, you know, service and business to business. Customer acquisition and customer retention, right? 
um, segmentation, marketing optimization. You know, Demand Center is basically, the big one for Microsoft, is basically a marketing optimization tool. Right? It's a tool to make more cost-effective use of limited marketing resources by targeting them at the highest value outcomes and using experimentation and data and machine learning to do that. Um, product improvement, so the instrumentation of products and gaining a better understanding about how customers and indeed users are using it. One of the, the sort of the all up use cases is um, this one of user analytics and optimization, right? The idea that for all these systems that we build, we actually don't have a great idea of how customers are using them or how users are using them. Um, and to the extent that many of our IT systems are very significant time sinks within our organization, any ability to extract additional productivity by improving through machine learning those systems themselves um, is quite a big opportunity. Um, retail, obviously. So um, anybody read the McKinsey report on the Internet of Things? Nobody? Go to McKinsey, just punch into Bing McKinsey uh, Internet of Things and everybody's favorite top tier strat firm must have spent mega bucks, wrote a 120 page detailed report on use cases and scenarios um, in Internet of Things. It's, uh, it's well worth uh, chucking on your Kindle and having a read off. Um, but they see retail as one of the, you know, one of the if not the largest sort of IoT areas of opportunity. Um, you know, things like tracking and customer targeting. Um, things like store optimization, right? You know, so actually, um, people go to the supermarket and see those little, the little things on the, on the shelf where they can, just, they can just whiz around and change the prices on things. Right? Um, they are changing those prices really regularly. Right? Why are they doing that? Because they're looking at what's the market going to be. <laughs> right? They are doing, well, not real time, but, you know, certainly in the age of retail, you know, changing the price every, every day or so, near real time pricing optimization. Again, that's experimentation, folks. What are they experimenting with? You and I. Right. What can they get away with? Um, smart products, right, you know, so we put a chip in it, right? Take a dumb device, um, you know, put a chip in it. Um, discrete manufacturing, you know, particularly here, um, sort of starting in the very, very high value goods. Um, by high value, I'm talking jet engines and airplanes and um, diggers and cranes. Um, you know, if you've got a crane on your container wharf, that crane is connected back to the manufacturer and sending instrumentation data off it the whole time. If you've got diggers, right, tractors, all of those sorts of things. John Deere, big IoT organization now. All their tractors come out. They got, they got IoT integrated, you put a SIM card into them, they feed data back to, back to home base, and they use that to both deliver a better experience for the customer, but also to learn how their products are being used and to learn how to improve them. Um, smart assets, so again, taking that same data feed, obviously Empire works a lot with the big mining firms, but they have a lot of quite smart trucks over in some of those big holes in the outback of Australia, including some that drive themselves. Um, you know, instrumenting assets to, to sweat them harder, right? You know, often this is, you know, predictive maintenance is not, not so much about, you know, um, it's about optimizing the time between maintenance schedules, right? You can always set a maintenance schedule that's extremely conservative and reduces your breakdowns, right? But it costs you a whole lot more money and it costs you a whole lot more planned downtime, right? And, pursuit of avoiding unplanned downtime. A lot of these smart asset solutions, predictive maintenance and so forth, are really targeted around rebalancing that more intelligently, sweating stuff much, much harder um, if you can get away with it. Fraud and compliance. Um, you know, big users of machine learning, um, you know, fraud and compliance. So, Going about doing this. To get there, you need to be embracing experimentation. You know, if you are going to create a system of intelligence, that system of intelligence, before it can be amenable to machine-based intelligences trying stuff, it has to be amenable to human-based intelligences trying stuff. It must be malleable. 
maybe by virtue of being an agile type of software solution, but the, the low-hanging fruit, folks, is actually end-user customizable cartridge-based software systems. It's got to be observable. Capture more data. Err on the side of capturing more data. Right? And particularly, you want to be capturing data about how the system's being used, not just whether it's broken or not. Make sure that you are thinking about getting that system into a state where it's engaged as quickly as possible. You can't do real reasonable experimentation until it's actually in use. Um, and the more use you've got, the more raw material you've got to try different things with. When it comes to systems of intelligence, doing data science is becoming much, much easier. Knowing which data science to do isn't really. Um, you know, so the, probably the biggest thing you need to think about in terms of sort of your organizational development is finding and fostering people with analytical skills. You don't necessarily need to go and find those out of the information science department at AUT or Otago or Waikato or whatever. You go find them out of the psychology department, right? Go find them out of the, you know, other parts of the sciences. Go find them out of social sciences and so forth. There's actually a whole lot of latent talent sitting out there with strong analytical skills. Um, and you've probably got a bunch of people inside your organization already who you could potentially bring to bear on this stuff. Um, and then survey for opportunities, right? Look to, look to where you've got interesting data and processes to work with already. Most CRM systems are pretty well geared to starting to do some of this sort of stuff. Right? You've probably got some pretty good data sets to start to have um, a tinker with. You know? And then the place where this is most commonly going to be deployed around those customer-facing applications and sites, sometimes employee-facing stuff, um, and increasingly around IoT. And again, that, that covers sort of the gambit from, you know, from wearables through smart assets through smart products and so forth. And with that, hopefully I've done okay for time and I'll take some questions. I do want questions. Anybody? Stunned amazement. Again, every year, stunned amazement. Is it interesting content? Good. Keen to do some interesting stuff. So the question was, is the SQL Server going to have the full suite of R? So what it's going to have, it's going to have the, the Revolution R runtime, which is a parallel processor ready runtime for R. Depending on where you're running it, you'll get you get some different mileage about exactly which set of libraries you can run. It's absolutely always going to be able to run plain old native R code. For libraries where the R reaches out into, you know, sort of compiled C++ or something like that, it, it may be a little more patchy. We've not run into any major problems so far playing with, you know, things like XGBoost and some of those sorts of things. So, you know, it, it, you should get pretty broad coverage in SQL Server with R. But even if you can't, as long as you're happy to have the runtime run outside of SQL Server as well, um, then you can run all the libraries. You know, so the revolution stuff can run in process in SQL Server. The benefit of that is it's basically, it's in process and it's a cross memory call um, to hit that data. Moving out of process, you're gonna go across named pipes actually on the SQL Server or over ODBC back to your, your client machine. Um, so, Everything is doable, it's just whether you can do it at the sort of the full, you know, pedal to the metal, um, high performance and process stuff. Yeah, get, gather data as much as you can, what about the ethics? So, did anybody, I wrote an article, I think it was for Retail Magazine a few weeks ago. Um, which, which the, the sort of the, the, the premise of is that um, machines don't judge. So, you know, we, we get very upset about, you know, privacy and the ethics of data and all those sorts of things. Actually, machines aren't judgmental. People are judgmental, right? Machines only do what people tell them to do. And so to the extent that you can 
you know, that you, that you are responsible in how you configure the machine, right? Many of those, you know, those problems go away. There was a great paper from the guys at the Brookings Institution. The, he's the author of a book called um, uh, Future of Violence, which is another great, great book that's worth reading. But talking about the fact that we get, we get very upset about the privacy implications of all this data gathering, and we basically ignore all the benefits. Um, and actually, we need a bit of a rebalancing around the benefits. Yeah, absolutely, there are ethical challenges around how much of that data we gather. You know, probably the biggest way to solve that is around transparency. And the other great way to solve that is around making sure you're careful about how much that gets in front of real people. Because right? if everything can be done by a machine, again, the machine is not, is not judging. Right? As soon as you put it in front of a person, you know, that person's natural biases and all those sorts of things come into play. If it's just a machine that's just running rules, right, you know, you're good to go. There are still some, you know, some interesting things to think about there. The, the scenario I've been thinking about recently is everybody's seen that, that Volt, that VW engine thing, right? So let me paint for you a scenario. So the executives from VW go into Congress and, and get grilled, and actually they say, well, you know, we built, a, we built a machine learning system and gave it some parameters that about you know, what it's like to drive on the roads and the parameters of the tests and all those sorts of things. And we sent it off on a machine learning exercise and it built this algorithm and then we just put that in the car. So it's not our fault. That's a problem. And in fact, that is, that is going to be a real problem with this machine learning stuff, right? We've deployed this intelligent system and it's done something that we think was wrong, but actually, you know, either we, we forgot to program that as being wrong, or we didn't know it was wrong, or the output of the machine learning algorithm was so completely unintelligible we didn't actually understand how the hell it worked, just that it did work. You know, that, that's an interesting area as well. So hopefully that sort of answers your question. You know, transparency is the key. But the other thing to reinforce with people, you know, and we, we need to establish trust, but one way to do that is to help people on that journey to understanding that <coughs> machines don't judge them. Right. You know, people judge them. You know, and to the extent that something is going to offer me up different advertising based on the fact that it knows my sexuality, all it's trying to do is sell me stuff. It's not making a moral judgment. Right. All it's trying to do is sell me stuff. And now it may feel awkward, but getting over that is actually to our benefit. That's the optimistic glass half full view. <laughs> Other questions? Folks, thank you very much for coming to Dynamics Day again this year. It's always great to have you here. Um, I'm going to be kicking around all day, pretty easy to find, very, bright, very loud shirt. Uh, enjoy. Am I standing between lunch? No, you've got one more session before lunch, so I'm probably going to get my backside kick because I've gone 10 minutes over. Thank you very much. I'll let you get away.